Hi there, welcome to today's webinar and thank you for joining us. I'm Laura Berman on the HashiCorp marketing team. Um, and today we have Justin Weisick on our technical marketing team. Um, and he's gonna give us an overview of Vault 1.5. After the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. So please submit your questions throughout the presentation and we'll answer them at the end. Um, we'll also be recording this webinar and sending it out later this week. So without further ado, I'd love to pass it on to my colleague, Justin. Over to you, Justin. Hey, awesome. Thanks very much. Um, so welcome to the webinar today. Um, let me just change to the next slide. So we're going to be chatting about um, Vault 1.5 and sort of the new features that were released uh, yesterday. Um, we'll sort of go through, um, obviously, there's a lot of bug fixes and improvements and sort of, um, but there's a sort of a core set of features that I wanted to focus on. Uh, and so here's the agenda for uh, what we'll go through today. Um, I realize um, we probably have a mix of uh, folks on the line. Um, you know, uh, you might be existing users that have uh, used the product for, you know, several years or several months, but we also have a, a slew of new users that are also using the product. So I just wanted to quickly chat about sort of Vault 101 uh, just for a couple minutes. We'll sort of level set, and then we can go into the uh, various features that uh, we're going to focus on today. A big part of yesterday's announcement was um, uh, Splunk app for monitoring sort of telemetry and log data. Um, it's pretty cool in that uh, you know if you're an existing uh, Splunk user and you you know use that to sort of centralize all your log management and uh, you know you do all your data analysis in there and stuff like that. You can uh, pipe over all your logs from Vault and all your telemetry into Splunk. And then the Splunk app is basically a set of canned or templated dashboards that uh, we've created, um, which would be pretty cool in that you, know, you don't have to go through and sort of um, um, you know, put together your own dashboards. You can just use the ones we've provided or obviously modify them or whatever. Uh, we've added a new feature uh, called resource quotas, which is essentially like rate limiting. So, um, say you have a centralized vault server, um, and you know, you maybe have a misbehaving application that's making tons of requests per second. You have ways to control that now, which is awesome. You know, it prevents denial of service attacks. Um, it's available in both open source and enterprise. Uh, we've added Red Hat OpenShift support, um, in the Helm chart. Uh, we've made some replication UI improvements and then obviously many other improvements. So, um, what I'm going to do is we'll just jump into the Vault uh, 101. Um, actually, I should probably also mention that um, uh, you know the setup for today's uh, talk is going to be about uh, probably about 40 minutes. We'll zip through a bunch of slides, but I also have uh, uh, live demos that I want to do, and then um, we also like to uh, take questions. So uh, if you have any questions throughout the uh, talk or anything like that, there's um, a little question and answer box that uh, just popped in there and we'll, um, we'll zip through them at the end. All right, uh, let's dive in. So what is Vault? Um, Vault's a, a centralized service that you put on your network that you know can store all of your secret data. And when I say secret data, what do I mean? Um, think about when you're uh, building an application, you know, um, a three-tier web app or something like that. You know, on the on the web server side, you're going to have uh, SSL certificates. You're going to have um, usernames and passwords for databases. You're going to have all types of API keys for interacting with um, you know external services. You might even have uh, SSL certificates um, you know used internally for connecting to or maybe authenticating to various services and things like that. Um, so throughout your infrastructure, you're going to have tons of different secrets. And uh, it obviously becomes challenging to do that manually, right? If you have them littered throughout uh, version control or uh, you know, on your file system, uh, sitting in config files or on developer laptops or whatever, this is a way to sort of wrangle that secret sprawl and put it into a central place. Um, obviously, locating all this in a central place, you want to have a high security environment, right? So we encrypt data at risk, uh, encrypt uh, data in transit. Um, you know, we have uh, support for you know wrapping um, uh, the encryption with say HSM or something like that. So 
just because you're putting it in a centralized place, it doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, less secure or anything like that. I'd, I'd argue that it's obviously way more secure and that you have a standardized workflow that everyone's now adopted. That's like highly secure. And, uh, you know, now it's uh, audited and logged and all that type of stuff versus having, you know, a hundred different methods or a hundred different teams doing their own thing, right? Um, so that's sort of the secret management piece. Um, we now have, um, well, we've had uh, for a long time, a data encryption uh, piece called transit, which um, since you have this, uh, you, since you have Vault acting as a central store for all your secret data, Kind of makes sense to maybe enable other use cases like data encryption. So now say, hey, um, I want to encrypt a piece of data. You can send it over to Vault. Uh, Vault will use its encryption keys and then um, uh, pass the encrypted data back to you. The use case here is say, um, you know, maybe I want to encrypt a bunch of data um, like uh, passport numbers or, you know, um, some sort of serial numbers or something like that in a database. You might, uh, you know, uh, run a script to say, hey, I want to encrypt this data, pass it over to Vault, and it passes it back, and you go and store that. We also have, uh, in Vault 1.4, we released something called uh, the Transform Secret Engine. Um, that's part of our advanced data protection module. This allows you to do um, vaultless tokenization. So say you had a credit card number, and you want to, um, uh, you know, say, tokenize it. You can hit Vault using the Transform Secret Engine, get back, um, something that looks like a serial number, you know, it'll ma maintain the same pattern, um, but it's uh, encrypted data. So then you don't need to say modify your database tables or anything to store that encrypted data. So, you know, you can think of Vault as sort of like a Swiss army knife, uh, sort of secret management type stuff that sits on your network. Um, and it's uh, both open source and has enterprise features. All right, so that's sort of my Vault 101 uh, spiel. So let's dive into the rest of the uh, talk here. So a big, a big feature of Vault uh, 1.5 was uh, our Splunk um, uh, app. This is a series of um, you know, dashboards that are pre-canned that we've uh, sort of curated that allow you to monitor all aspects of Vault. You know, so you can go in and monitor, hey, how's the host actually doing? Um, you know, uh, is the CPU maxed out? Does it have enough disk space? What's the uh, network traffic look like? But it also allows you to go in and instrument all of um, the telemetry that we've exposed within Vault. Um, so what I want to do is just quickly jump out of the slides and uh, uh, show you what this looks like. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, we released a blog called, um, you know, announcing Vault uh, 1.5. And in here, there's a whole section on um, monitoring telemetry data, um, uh, telemetry and log data with Splunk. The reason why I'm showing you this is that, um, you know, there's a lot more material in here that I could cover even in an hour if we dedicated the whole time to that. So um, if this is interesting to you, I would highly recommend uh, going over to the blog and then reading this little section. And we've re released a bunch of different stuff here. One. One thing we released that's outside of this uh, Splunk integration is something called the performance tuning guide. So if you're running Vault in production and you want to say, hey, um, you know, I obviously want to have a highly performing environment. Um, you know, is there any uh, tuning that I can do around Vault? Um, you know, in the side menu here, you can see like OS tuning, you know, Vault tunings, um, uh, backend storage tuning, all that kind of stuff. And the guide is absolutely massive and it has lots of different uh, tips in here. Obviously, Vault, like by default, is going to be pretty performant. But if you're trying to eke out that extra little bit of um, uh, performance, that'll definitely help you. Um, so we have a dedicated blog post here. Um, that's on the Splunk side. Um, they've uh, written about it too. But uh, uh, where is it here? This one. So if you go into this blog post, there's a uh, about a 10 minute video that walks you through all the various dashboards. Um, the one thing that I wanted to show, to show you is that if you're using Splunk today um, and you're an enterprise customer of Vault and you want to like get going with this, how do you actually do that? Um, so there's a, a sign up form in that um, uh, blog post that'll you enter your email and away you go. And then we have a, a learn guide, which uh, basically walks you through it step by step. 
If you've never seen the uh, Learn site before, sorry, I'm going off on a bit of tangent, but uh, I just want to highlight this because I think it's sort of a gold mine. Um, if you've never, if you're new to Vault or you're trying to play around with it or uh, want to learn a various feature or something like that, we have a site called learnhashicorp.com slash vault. And you go in here and this is like uh, hands-on labs. Um, so you can see there's 14 different topics. Uh, the first one is, hey, how do I uh, get started with Vault? Uh, there's a video there, basically walks you through like, um, how do I start? How do I use my first secret? How do I, uh, you know, uh, put it in Vault? How do I get it out of Vault? How do I, you know, um, embed that into my programs, etc. Right. Um, also, if you're if you're um, want to play around with Kubernetes, we have tons of different stuff in here. You know, almost four hours of content. So that's sort of the Splunk piece. It's a uh, sort of the intent here is to save you tons of time, right? If um, you're using Splunk, we don't want you to have to go and, um, oops, sorry about that, wrong button. So if you're using Splunk, we don't want you to have to spend like days setting up dashboards, right? This should be a, an easy thing where you can just hit the form. If you have Splunk running, download the app, uh, and then obviously have access to the dashboards. Should be Should be pretty cool. All right, so the next uh, thing I wanted to chat about was uh, resource quotas. This one I'm super excited about in that uh, uh, lots of people have asked about this. So since Vault is sitting centrally on your network and um, you know you have applications reading and writing secrets from it, um, sometimes uh, applications misbehave, right? Uh, say for example, uh, uh, maybe there's an error in an application and all of a sudden it gets into a crazy loop where it's uh, ask, doing a high rate of requests per second to uh, vault. You know, maybe it's uh, asking for like a thousand secrets a second or something when typically it's only um, asking for maybe 10 secrets a second, right? So there's a few different ways uh, that you can sort of look at this. One is with uh, resource quotas in that now we have a way of limiting the amount of requests per second to a various um, uh, path. So you can see in here, hey, I'm uh, putting a secret at, at, at this particular path. Um, now we can have the ability to say, hey, I, I want to limit this to you know, 10 requests per second or something like that. So we, ha we have that ability to do it on the path specific, but we also have a, a way of doing it uh, globally. You can see up here, we have a, a global rate and I hit the uh, max rate of 500 requests per second. So I thought what we do is like, um, it's kind of cool to chat about it, but actually let's just demo this and see what it looks like. So I'm just going to um, switch over to the console here one sec. All right. Um, so what I have here is um, obviously it's a terminal. And then in the bottom window here, I'm gonna run um, a vault server in dev mode. Uh, if, you're, if you're new to vault, uh, dev mode is basic. So before I mentioned, hey, you're running vault as a centrally managed service, obviously you wanna have a high security, right? Um, there's a little bit of a setup process to actually make that happen. So to get around that when you're first learning vault or just want to play around with various features we've enabled this dev mode which sort of presets up vault it unseals it um, and it uh, allows you to do things very quickly so uh, that's what i'm going to demo today uh, so uh, we just ran vault in dev mode i just need to grab this uh, root token this allows me to log into vault um, I'm just going to save that over here. Then in the top window here, I'm just going to make sure that I can, um, I'm just exporting this uh, environment variable so that uh, when I run vault, the client, it knows how to talk to vault the server. All right. So I'm just going to copy and paste these commands just for the uh, sake of time here. Um, so what we're doing is we're saying, hey, I want to set up a vault secret. I want to enable a secret engine called uh, the key value store. Um, and we're going to set up the path as slash test. And so the key value store basically allows you to store key values. So say, for example, it was um, uh, you wanted to store uh, 
a, a username and then here's what the username is or hey i want to store a password here's what the password is or api keys or any of that type of stuff it's just sort of very, a very generic place that you can store secret data um, then what we're going to do is we're going to write a um, we're going to write a, a resource quota um, for that test path uh, with a rate limit of one request per second um, and then I'll show you how we can uh, test that. So, you know, we're um, updating the system config, we're setting the quota rate limit, um, and then this is what we're calling it, and then on that path that we just enabled. So I just want to explain this for a sec because it's a little bit nuanced. So typically, you know, we're running in dev mode with just one path here, but typically in a large, say, enterprise organization, you're going to have a ton of different paths. You might have, um, you know, app one, two, three, all the way to a thousand or something like that. And then you're going to have your various um, uh, passwords for that app stashed in there. And so this, uh, having this ability to um, rate limit based on a path gives you very fine grained control on, hey, you know what, this app only requests uh, a secret, uh, you know, 10 times a second or something like that. It allows you to like set that limit or, hey, you know, this app uh, requests uh, hundred secrets a second or something like that. So you can um, go in and sort of set these appropriately. Obviously, I wouldn't uh, maybe go uh, too crazy with it while you're first learning it. Um, also, having um, you know uh, capturing logging and telemetry data is a good sort of indicator of how, how many requests per second you're using, or you know when you run into problems. Obviously, you can debug it that way. All right, so uh, we've set up the uh, rate limit. And then we can just uh, read that rate limit out too, just to verify that, hey, it's doing what we think it is. Great. So this is a very simple example, right? We've, uh, we're doing one request per second. Um, so how can we sort of test that? Uh, or how can you test that if you just want to sort of learn this, right? So I've set up a, a example script here and it's called a uh, rate limit test. All this is doing is saying, hey, I'm using the vault client, I'm using the uh, key value engine, I'm saying, hey, I want to put a secret into vault at this particular path. So test credentials one, and then I want to set the secret data. Um, since I'm doing this in like a shell script, this is going to execute these commands in sequence. Um, obviously, it's going to go super fast. So what I'm expecting to see here is that the first request will succeed. And then since we're going to do these requests um, you know, in sequence, it will happen within obviously much less than a second that these two second uh, requests here should fail. So let's go ahead and uh, run that. And then uh, we'll see what happens. All right, great. So you can see um, the first uh, secret was saved. And then when it hit credential two, it said, hey, um, you know, we've run into an error. Uh, We've also returned an HTTP status code of uh, 429, which is uh, too many requests per second. Try again. So this gives you the ability in your app to actually build in this logic of, hey, if I see this uh, a status code of 429, maybe I want to do some sort of exponential back off or something like that. Um, you know, follow, say, distributed systems design uh, best practices. Uh, so you're going to get this uh, error. Um, and same thing, uh, the third request uh, failed. But, you know, obviously that's sort of a trivial example in that one request per second, uh, that's not probably real world, like what you're actually gonna do. So what I wanted to do was actually set the numbers a little bit higher, and then we'll use a load generation tool to actually uh, see what this does. Um, so let me just copy uh, this root token. I just need to set something up here and then I'll explain uh, what we're doing. So I'm using uh, a load generation tool called um, Hey. Uh, if you want to Google it, uh, go for it. But uh, I'll just sort of walk through what we're going to do. So I'm, I'm essentially uh, using this sort of curl command where I'm saying, hey, I want to use this vault token. This is a root token. You're probably not going to do, obviously not going to do this in production. Because you're going to have uh, you know, fine grained user control and stuff like that. But uh, for the sake of this test, this works. And then we're going to make a HTTP GET request uh, to the uh, key value secret engine that we set up at the test path. 
and we're going to pull out our credential one. And oh, didn't work for some reason. Maybe I didn't copy that uh, root token properly. One sec here. Perfect. So you can see the root token was different. Um, you know, when we set up our uh, dev server, it spits out, hey, what the root token is. And uh, when I was running this demo before, I uh, forgot to update it. So uh, we've updated it now to the proper one. And if we hit enter here, boom, perfect. All right. So we get back our uh, secret data. And now what I want to do is basically automate this sort of curl command or what we're, uh, the data that we're pulling out here into uh, something that we can sort of generate like, you know, thousands of requests per second and see what happens. So um, I've, I've done that with this command where I'm saying I'm using the hey load generation tool. I'm saying, uh, funny enough, hey, I want to make 2000 requests per second with a current currency of 50. And then I'm passing in sort of my, um, you know, we're uh, logging into vault, and then I'm going to pull out that uh, test data. So what we're expecting to see here is, um, you know, obviously we've set the rate limit at uh, one request per second. So we're looking to see probably uh, one request succeed, and then we're looking to see uh, a whole bunch of errors. Great. So you can see here that we generated it, um, took less than a second. Um, we got around um, uh, 22,000 requests per second. Uh, Obviously, it only did 2,000, so it, I guess it uh, calculates how many would be completed in one second. And then you can see our one successful request with a status code of 200. And then you can see we have uh, 1,999 requests that failed with the error of too many requests per second. So let's go ahead and bump this up a little bit. Um, so if we go ahead and read this, you can see, hey, uh, it's set to one request per second right now. Let's go bump this up to say 100 requests per second. If we read that out again, great. And then let's rerun our uh, load generation tool. Now we should hopefully see around 100 requests succeeding. Great. So obviously this is a, not exact, but it's uh, definitely in the ballpark of what we'd expect. Um, you can rerun this a whole bunch of times. Sometimes it's because, um, hey, I'm running the command and the window of one second overlaps, or sometimes it goes over one second slightly. But uh, you can see this uh, works. Um, so let's bump it up to maybe 500 requests per second. Rerun it. Great. So the, the goal here is to basically protect Vault in that if you're if Vault's sitting on your network acting as a central service, and you know you have uh, you know hundreds or thousands of apps all hitting it for secrets. You don't want one misbehaving app to be able to like DDoS uh, vault and take it offline. Obviously, we have uh, uh, ways of dealing that with that in vault without um, using uh, uh, resource quotas. And that, you know, we have, uh, you know, it's typically not one instance of vault. Vault's typically like a cluster. You might have replication or performance replicas. So uh, we have ways of it, adding massive capacity into vault to scale up to you know, tens of thousands of requests per second. But the resource quota feature here gives you a way of uh, protecting vault, also protecting your applications in that uh, you, know, you can export telemetry data of this feature to uh, you know, capture this on a dashboard or something like that. Um, that's sort of what I wanted to show. I think there's one more thing that I want to um, show in here in that uh, so if we go ahead and read this, um, you can see, hey, we're protecting the path slash test. What I want to do is just delete that. And then I wanted to show you sort of the global rate limit. Um, you know, that protects, um, you know, a sort of path. But say, for example, you've done load testing on your vault cluster and, you know, um, you know given on this uh, uh, hardware and in our various configuration and our storage backend, you know, we can support um, 1,500 requests per second. Um, and then if we read that, you can say, hey, there's a global rate. There's no path associated with it. And I want to limit Vault to 1,500 requests per second. Now, if we go ahead and do our uh, rate limit, um, you can see that 
it uh, limits it to roughly 1900. I think what's happening here is it's going over the uh, span of a window. So we're almost, this is almost taking two seconds. So let's go ahead and change this to like, you know, 10,000 requests. Great. So this is sort of like an even distribution of what we'd expect to see. And that, um, you know, it's taken a little bit longer. We are seeing a, a lot more requests being denied. Um, you know, we can even bump this up to say 20,000 or something. We should see, yeah, perfect. Um, the reason why we don't uh, give sort of benchmarks with what you should use around rate limiting is that it obviously depends on your environment, right? You know, um, your architecture, the storage backends that you're using, sort of the use cases. So it's hard to give like a blanket use case of uh, what what sort of global rate limit you should use, or if you want to use uh, rate limits on, based on a path or something like that. Um, but I wanted to jump back to the presentation and then show you sort of the documentation that you can use on this feature if you're interested in sort of playing around with it. So let's go back here. Um, I'll sort of keep going back to the blog post here and that there's all the links if you want to get um, uh, sort of up and running with this. So, you know, if you just Google vault 1.5, you'll, you'll find this blog post. Um, so we have a resource quota section. We have a dedicated blog. There's also documentation and a learn guide. So I'll just show you the documentation and learn guide. Um, again, I, our learn site is basically just a gold mine of uh, content. I use it all the time and, uh, you know, obviously I work here. Um, it's just amazing for, you know, hands-on tutorials of how to learn about a various feature or finding the documentation. Um, so this tutorial basically walk you through what I just showed you. Um, you know, you can set all the rate limits, uh, do all that kind of, kind of stuff. Um, but there's one thing in here that I wanted to show you. So if we go into the dedicated uh, blog post, um, there's a section in here on uh, monitoring. And I think it's super important to enable telemetry monitoring if you're going to use resource quotas. Um, you'll probably, depending on if you're using an audit log or not, uh, it, you'll have to turn on resource quota logging within the audit log. Basically the audit log logs any data coming in and out of vault so that you can reconstruct what happened if an error happens or say a secret gets exposed, who was accessing that secret, all that kind of stuff. But around uh, uh, resource quota metrics, now you can um, say, hey, what was the rate limit uh, of these violations? Uh, what quota actually hit the violation? What's it doing right now? So you can sort of profile not only profile what's happening right now, but also if when things go wrong, you can figure out, hey, do I need to adjust this quota or something like that, which is obviously super useful. Um, great, so let's jump back into the presentation and we'll zip over to the next uh, feature. Um, cool, so the next one that I wanted to sort of chat about is um, if you're using Vault and, and you're using Kubernetes on site, we have something called the uh, uh, Vault Helm chart. I, I, I know a lot of people are using it already, but if you're not familiar with it, it basically allows you to, with a, just a few commands, get a Vault cluster up and running on Kubernetes. Um, we support a, a whole variety of different scenarios from uh, dev mode to HA, um, uh, also to enterprise if you wanna do replication or something like that. We've integrated in the Helm chart our integrated uh, storage feature so that um, you know, all the storage happens within the vault cluster. You don't need to use an external storage backend or something. Uh, the latest feature in this is that we've also added uh, Red Hat OpenShift support. So for a long time, if you wanted to, you know, obviously we supported all the cloud providers, uh, you know, AWS, Azure, GCP, all that type of stuff. Um, but we also realized in an enterprise setting that tons of people are using Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, so we wanted to, um, uh, get that going and it was in beta for a bit and now it's uh, been released. So what I want to do is I'm not going to actually show you on an OpenShift cluster. I'm just going to show you the Helm chart in general, um, uh, how to get going with it. But if you're interested in playing around with this, we have a very detailed, uh, again, learn guide on it. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over to a, a console again and I'll just uh, show you what the Helm chart looks like. Um, just one sec here. Just trying to find the right window. 
All right. Great. So hopefully you can see my uh, console now. Um, so what I have uh, going here is a kube cluster uh, get nodes. I have a three node kube cluster running in uh, Google Cloud. Um, I just wanted to show you this because um, uh, it's super easy to get going. The workflow is exactly the same. Uh, and I'll show you how if you were wanted to say flip over from using say a cloud provider to what you're doing internally, or you want to use what you're doing internally to flip over to a cloud provider, the workflow is uh, totally seamless. Um, so let's um, also uh, in the bottom panel here, I have um, uh, kube, kubectl get pods running just in a loop. So that as we fire things up, we can sort of see, hey, what's going on. Um, so the use case here is that, uh, hey, you're running Kubernetes, you want to play around with Vault, or maybe you want to get a production Vault cluster going. How do you actually do that? So for a, a while there, we had our Helm chart just located in uh, um, a GitHub repo. But um, we realized that's not how people interact with uh, Helm. Quite, quite often, they want to use the Helm repo. So what we've done is we've added our own Helm repo. And this is uh, basically the steps for how you'd uh, get that added. Um, so you say Helm repo add, HashiCorp, and then here's our uh, Helm repo. Boom. You get that added. And then um, you can search, just use the um, Helm search. Uh, and you can see, hey, we have our uh, HashiCorp uh, vault repo or Helm chart. Also, if you search in here, you can see that we have uh, uh, consoles in here too. So if you want to play around with uh, console or vault, uh, away you go. So the way, what I wanted to quickly show you here is that um, once you have the, uh, the, Helm, the vault Helm chart installed, uh, basically, you can just interact with it with, uh, you know, config files. So if I wanted to, right now I have it pointing at uh, Google Cloud, but if I wanted to um, say, hey, you know what, this is an OpenShift cluster, uh, all you need to do is modify a few values in the um, uh, Helm charts uh, config file and uh, you should be set up. So what, what I've done here is I've just uh, created an overrides file that shows you what those values would look like. So you know we're gonna uh, set a global variable that'll say, hey, um, you know this is a OpenShift cluster. Uh, that's true. And also, if you wanted to say, um, you know, I want to use HA mode. I think in HA mode the default is uh, three replicas, but maybe I want to use five replicas or something like that. And then away you'd go. So in this example, again, I'm just gonna uh, point at uh, Google Cloud, um, uh, my GKE cluster get nodes. Um, and then I'll, I'll show you what this looks like. So I'm going to say, hey, Helm install. Uh, I want to use the, the official Helm chart. And then I'm going to set the server up into uh, dev mode. Again, we support like HA, um, uh, you know, standalone, uh, if you want to use integrated storage, all that kind of stuff. I could use an override file for this, but I'm just setting it at the command line here. So once this is done, we should. Perfect. We already see it in the bottom uh, panel here and that we have a, a vault uh, single instance uh, running in dev mode coming up. We also have the agent injector coming up. Um, and then if I wanted to say log into vault, um, uh, play around with it or whatever, if I want to learn it or go through some labs or whatever, um, you know, I can uh, use the kubectl command to exec into vault and get the status. One kind of cool thing here is that uh, this agent injector this allows you to inject secrets into Kubernetes pods that have no knowledge of Vault. So what does that actually mean? So say I have an existing application. Uh, maybe I'll step back for a sec. So say you're running infrastructure, you're not using Vault at all. And then all of a sudden you're saying, hey, uh, you know, this Vault tool could be kind of cool to use. It could simplify our workflow, you know, reduce the secrets ball, all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's, uh, a challenge in there in that you need to modify your applications to start, you know, uh, calling Vault, calling the Vault API to actually get secrets out of it. So, you know, you're going to, uh, maybe you're, you have a web app and you want to connect to a database and you want to, um, during that process, while the web app's booting up, you might have to modify the code in there to say, hey, uh, hit Vault, 
uh, go grab the connection string, which is a username and password, maybe where the uh, cluster lives or something like that. And then uh, put together this connection string and then connect to the um, database. Um, that's sometimes a challenge for folks uh, to maybe they don't have the developer resources or they don't have um, uh, um, you know, the code anymore to do it or something like that. So this agent injector gives you the ability to actually inject secrets right into the file system of a, a running container. And then, you know, we have a, a templating language in there that allows you to say, um, you know, construct all sorts of different formats. If it's a connection string or if it looks like a, um, uh, INI file or something like that, uh, you can do pretty much anything in there. What this allows you to do though, is uh, you can put a, a secret on the file system in a format the, the application uh, typically might already expect. And that's how you can inject secrets into uh, say legacy apps or something like that without having to go through this uh, uh, process of you know, modifying your applications. Obviously we suggest sort of people uh, modify their applications and that that's the most secure way to interact with Vault. But this uh, also gives you the ability to, to do that. Um, cool. So we have this uh, Vault uh, cluster running on Kubernetes right now. Um, you know, I, I showed you this command, which was basically installing uh, using the Helm chart. You know, we set the, the server there. What's the difference between just the standard Helm chart and uh, uh, wanting to do it on OpenShift? Well, it's not very much. And that uh, you know now we just say hey I want to do uh, I want to use the exact same command install it um, instead of I'm just adding this one uh, additional variable here and that says hey um, OpenShift equals true you know we're using dev mode again um, so if you're using uh, OpenShift super simple to get started um, you know obviously that's not like uh, you wouldn't do that in production or something like that. You're going to use like an overrides file. Um, you might have this in version control and all that type of stuff. But uh, if you're going to do um, something that's like production ready, you're going to use uh, these values and then you'll uh, do it this way. Um, I think that's it. So we can pull down this uh, cluster and then let's jump back to the presentation. And share. So that's the Helm chart. Again, uh, you know, I, obviously I'm zipping through this, uh, uh, you know, fairly fast. If you have any questions, make sure you just ask them in the question and answer uh, section of the webinar here, and then we'll uh, go through and uh, answer them. So the next uh, cool feature that's um, primarily targeted at enterprise users in that uh, replication is only supported uh, uh, in our enterprise binary. So rep, what is replication? So say, um, you know, I have Vault, it's running as a, I'm using open source Vault, it's running as a centralized uh, a key store for all my applications. Then all of a sudden you're thinking, hey, what do I do about disaster recovery or replication? Uh, you know, maybe I'm doing tens of thousands of requests per second into Vault. Um, you know, maybe I'm doing, uh, uh, I'm using the transit engine to do batch uh, encryption and decryption of credit card data or something like that. Uh, uh, you know, we need a more stable environment. What do we do? That's where we start getting into the uh, enterprise features. Uh, so we have an enterprise feature called uh, replication, which supports both disaster recovery um, uh, clusters as well as performance. So say for example, I'm running in data center A um, and I wanna go have a failover into data center B. How do I do that? That's, that's the use case of where you'd use replication or Maybe I'm uh, doing, uh, you know, tens of thousands of uh, batch credit card encryption and decryption, uh, payment processing, or something like that. Um, I'm doing that in two data centers, um, but Vault is running in one of them. We have the ability to run a performance replica in the second data center that uh, you know gives you enhanced performance. So we've uh, updated the user interface uh, in Vault. Uh, to give you better sort of debugging and troubleshooting uh, capabilities. Um, so what I wanted to do is uh, just quickly show you what that looks like. Uh, where is the... So again, in the um, uh, blog post, uh, we had a, um, our design team went 
uh, was kind enough to write a, a blog post here that basically walks through it. So if you're interested in design or want to know what the changes are, you're a replication user, uh, this blog post walks it through with screenshots uh, um, and shows you basically everything that uh, happened. So this is um, what the interface looked like before. And then uh, here's what it looks like now. And then it uh, goes into a, a, a whole, um, I guess, series of uh, sub pages where you can see exactly what's going on. Uh, not only works for um, just replication in general, say uh, uh, DR or disaster recovery nodes, but also uh, performance replicas. Um, pretty cool, like walks you through the journey. Uh, you can see, hey, uh, what are my disaster recovery nodes doing? What are my performance nodes doing? And they can uh, drive down into those various details. Um, also from a design perspective, I thought it was pretty cool and that uh, they walk through hey, uh, who are the various teams that were involved in uh, doing this? Obviously we collect um, you know, user feedback, uh, you know, product management, design, engineering, all has a uh, role to play here. And then it walks through sort of the workflow of how do we actually create these pages and, and what was sort of the logic that went into them. So, uh, I, I find it kind of cool in that, you know, sometimes you just use these pages and you think, oh yeah, this is uh, uh, neat, uh, but there's actually a lot of work that uh, went in behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, so what I wanted to do is uh, just chat about a couple more features and then maybe I'll show you the change log as the, there's, there's tons of stuff that went into this and then I'll, I'll maybe do that for a couple more minutes and then we'll jump over to uh, Q&A. So we have the vault monitor command. Um, we copied this from our uh, Nomad product. What this basically does is say I'm running vault uh, as a, a daemon behind the scenes. You know, it's, it's typically putting all its log data, um, you know, into the audit log or something like that. But how do you actually monitor what's going on? Say you're trying to troubleshoot something. Um, uh, how do you actually get real-time logs? We just added this vault monitor command and then you can specify the uh, debug level. This gives you access right at the console just to like log, connect a vault and say, hey, just start dumping all your logs out to the console so that I can do sort of real-time debugging. This isn't uh, something you're going to use every day, but um, you know, if you get into a situation where you're trying to debug something, obviously this uh, comes in super handy. Um, we've also added password policies. Uh, so Vault has the uh, concept of you know static secrets, which um, we sort of covered in the demo around rate limiting. Of hey, I'm going to enable this key value store. I, I want to stash a bunch of secret data there. Uh, we also have this concept of uh, dynamic secrets. Um, Dynamic secrets sort of span a spectrum of a whole bunch of different uh, use cases. Maybe I'm using uh, AWS and I want to get a API key or something like that. We have the ability within Vault to um, sort of act as a middleman that you ask Vault for an AWS API key behind the scenes, we'll go over to AWS, generate uh, an API key for you and then give it back. This is sort of like what we call a dynamic. Typically when we generate one of these dynamic uh, API keys, it has a TTL assigned to it, maybe for um, a very short period of time. Maybe you're doing a backup job or something like that. And your backup script connects to Vault, says, hey, give me an AWS uh, API key with a uh, time to live, basically an expiry of maybe one minute. Um, we pass that back to your script. Your script go do, uh, does its backup, and then uh, it uh, shuts down. The kind of use case, which was really cool here, is that we're not giving uh, highly privileged, um, you know, credentials to scripts anymore. You know, we can uh, have very confined, uh, tightly controlled uh, access keys that we give to scripts. And that, you know, if that API key was somehow exposed or something like that, it, it uh, most likely doesn't uh, isn't valid anymore because the expiry uh, already passed. So it's like uh, Vault, sort of a Swiss Army knife that gives you a lot of these type of tools. Part of the uh, dynamic uh, credentials, though, is that um, uh, we also have lots of integrations with, uh, say, uh, databases. You know, maybe your web app wants to connect to a database. It can ask Vault for a credential. Vault will go to that database, generate a, a username and password, um, and then pass it back to your app. So this pol password policies feature here it, uh, interacts with this sort of second use case in that when Vault is going and generating a password for you, you now have the ability to basically specify the format or you know, sort of the policy of what that password should look like. 
the reason we added this is that you know we were generating our passwords um, uh, before, but we realized that a lot of enterprise customers uh, will say, hey, you know what, our our internal policies mandate that our passwords look like a, a particular format or maintain a particular character set length and have these uh, special characters or something like that. So this is sort of like a just a, an enhancement around that in that you know you can now specify what those uh, passwords look like. Um, here's a couple of resources that you can use. Obviously, everything around the 1.5 launch, um, all the links are in the blog. So if you're, I just head over to the blog and go into the 1.5 release announcement, and then you'll find all the sub pages. I also wanted to reiterate that um, you know the Learn site is 100% a gold mine. If you're looking to um, get started with Vault or you're already an advanced user and you're looking to sort of ex it, um, extend your use cases, 100% go in there in that it's all free, it's not locked. You can just, you don't have to create an account or anything. It's just an amazing resource. Um, so what I think we'll do is, um, I think we'll jump over to QA now. Um, obviously, if you have any questions about anything we chatted about, uh, definitely um, uh, pop them in there. Another thing I wanted to mention is that um, um, in the announcement, um, you know, we covered sort of the core features, but there's also a whole slew of, uh, you know, other stuff that went into it. Um, you know, we have seal migration. Um, a little context here in that uh, when you're using Vault in a production environment, when it starts, it's the, the vault is typically sealed in well, it, 100 percent is sealed in that um, you need to enter a de, uh, uh, an, an encryption or basically you need to unlock uh, the seal or unseal it using a, a token or a series of tokens that basically say, hey, you know what, I, I, I'm an authorized user to unlock this vault and access secrets. So if you wanted to, um, maybe you're using a cloud HSM and you want to um, you know, go auto unseal that back to a, a different seal method, we support that. Um, we've also added a, a whole slew of um, you know, AWS features, OIDC. Um, you know, we added static credentials for MS SQL. This is um, uh, sort of what I uh, chatted about uh, before about uh, dynamic secrets there. But also if you wanted to, um, see just the general change log of, hey, hey what, what actually went into Vault 1.5? You know, we have all the uh, changes here, all the improvements to the various auth methods, and then um, all the bug fixes. So there's a whole slew of stuff in there that obviously we didn't touch on today. All right, so let's jump over to um, the questions. I'm just gonna pop open the QA panel and then uh, we'll start going. I apologize if there's a bit of lag here in that, uh, you know, I need to uh, read these and then answer them. So it uh, might be a little bit of um, uh, uh, lag in between as I'm reading these. Um, so is it possible to, uh, there's a question in here from uh, Jack saying, hey, is it uh, possible to use uh, logging and telemetry data with ELK 100%? In fact, there's a ton of people that are doing that today. Um, it's uh, totally a, a supported use case. Uh, I definitely, I definitely do that if you're not using Splunk. And that you sort of the logging data is invaluable, uh, right? Um, both from a telemetry sp perspective, if you want to use like uh, uh, Grafana or something like that to, to plot out, hey, hey, what's happening in my uh, uh, vault cluster? Also, Elk to basically index all your logs and stuff like that. 100% um, uh, supported use case. Um, definitely not locked to uh, uh, Vault or anything like that, or uh, Splunk. Um, can you block him coming? Uh, yeah, so there's a, another question from Jack in here that says, you know, a DDoS is still a DDoS. Can, do we have the ability to block um, uh, connections incoming to the cluster um, uh, it, besides just basically returning uh, the HTTP uh, 249 error uh, that says too many requests? Uh, we don't support that right now. Uh, this is the first pass of adding, um, you know, DDoS protection around rate limiting. Our primary, sort of the 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 way we that we recommend, um, you know, uh, vault clusters to be installed is there sort of a central centralized shared service that sit within your network, right? So it's 
uh, the chances of some external party DDoSing it directly in that, you know, it's going to be typically protected within your network are, um, I guess, maybe not as usual of a concern as just general rate limiting. Obviously, this is the first pass and we're still looking at like enhancements we can make, but uh, we wanted to uh, satisfy the initial request of, um, you know, I have a, a internal misbehaving application that all of a sudden might spike from say 10 requests per second to thousands. What do I do about that? Um, so uh, that's what we've done there. I, I, I don't know the roadmap around that feature, but I'd suspect just like everything that we're working on, uh, we're always looking to enhance it. But you could probably look at other DDoS mitigations that maybe you have in your enterprise for that. Um, any configuration changes um, needed to take advantage of the telemetry feature? Um, what I might actually show you here is uh, where is the telemetry guide? So I got too many tabs open here. I imagine just like everyone. So let me actually just uh, go back to the blog here and we'll go into the, uh, for, um, the blog post. Um, yeah, here we go. Again, it's just on the learn site, 100% uh, uh, gold mine of uh, um, uh, basically tutorials. So the request around, hey, what is a, uh, an elk stack look like? Or, hey, if I wanted to take advantage of the telemetry data or the audit log data, what do I actually do? This, this architecture basically gives you sort of a practical example. Uh, hey, I have a vault cluster running. Um, I'm going to pipe um, you know, my stats D data out into something like uh, Telegraph. And then I'm going to uh, forward that data into my uh, you know, this could, this says uh, Splunk here, but that could easily be uh, Grafana or something like that, right? Um, again, I'm, I'm taking my audit log data, I'm funneling it into the TD agent, and then I'm gonna uh, push that into my uh, log platform. You know, that could be out here. Um, and then basically we go through uh, step-by-step. Um, there's also a vault monitoring guide. If you um, just Google that, or maybe we can look for it on it or in, yeah, close to monitoring. Um, this this guide uh, goes through basically how to set up, how to set that up. Um, you know, we're using Telegraph, Influx, and Grafana. So um, those are 100% supported use cases to go through and do that. And we 100% recommend that people do it too. And that um, you know, when things if things go bad or you're trying to troubleshoot, hey, what's going on? Uh, you can go and do that. Um, Um, so there's a question in here from Jeff that says, hey, are resource quota metrics part of the Splunk app already? Uh, yes, they are. So um, if, uh, where is that? Um, let me go in here. Um, so as part of the Splunk app, you know, app, when you typically think about it, you think application, but uh, when you think Splunk app, you can think of it just as a series of uh, pre-canned dashboards or templates that we've provided. And within that uh, Splunk app, we've already enabled um, uh, the resource quota feature. So if uh, you go through this guide or, and you install the Splunk app in your um, uh, Splunk Enterprise uh, cluster, uh, you'll have resource quota. If you're using Vault 1.5, the newest release, you'll have resource quota metrics in there. So if you go and set it up, boom, it all just propagates right over into your Splunk environment. You don't need to do anything. Um, yeah, so there's a, um, a question in here that, hey, when's the Vault 1.5 version going to be available for Kubernetes? Um, I, the Docker images are built right now. We're just waiting on Docker Hub to uh, approve the images. So uh, basically with Docker Hub, they have the official images program. And once we roll out a new version of Vault 1.5, happened yesterday, we submit a PR into um, the official images repo for uh, Docker Hub. They have to review it and then they go and uh, uh, kick that off. We've already done that process. So it should be like a matter of hours, uh, typically not more than a day. So. Uh, you should see the new uh, Helm chart uh, with 1.5 rollout uh, anytime now. Um, uh, 
there's a question in here. Why does the uh, Vault logo uh, look like a telephone uh, keyboard? It's a good question. I'm not sure. I'll uh, I'll ask uh, the design team on that one. <laughs> um, So there's a question in here about, um, hey, uh, is there any update on integrated storage uh, backend? Yes, there is. So um, if you go look at the blog post here, there's a whole section on integrated storage. Um, uh, where is it here? So um, we haven't added auto, auto join yet. So the idea with auto join in a um, integrated storage cluster Maybe I'll take a step back for a sec. Integrated storage is the concept of, hey, I have a vault cluster. Um, I'm putting all these secrets in it. Where, does, where do those secrets actually physically live? Um, uh, we manage that through a thing called storage backends where you know, we support uh, you know, databases, file storage, uh, if you want to use console. Uh, uh, in vault 1.2, we added something called integrated storage, which allows you to actually uh, have vault itself manage that uh, sort of database, if you will. And uh, you do that through a config file and, it, and you know, it's used the RAF protocol to sort of replicate that data throughout the cluster. Um, a use case comes in of, hey, I'm running say a three or five node uh, uh, vault cluster. Uh, what happens if I wanna put a new node in? A lot of people obviously wanna use automation for that. Uh, we 100% get it, we're, we're working on it. Uh, right now it's a manual process to add that node in. And so auto join is the concept of, you know, can I just automate that? Uh, it's something that's on our, obviously our radar, we're, we're working on it, but um, I don't have anything to report yet. One thing that we've added in here is uh, something called HA storage in that, um, you know, it gives you the ability if you're using say a, a database or S3 or something like that, that you can get highly available storage backends out of uh, storage backends that aren't highly available. Um, it's sort of a niche topic, but if you're interested in uh, learning about it, if you're into um, you know, integrated storage and raft and, and learning about that, I'd 100% uh, go look at this and the learn guide. Um, do we have a native integration with uh, Elk? I don't think we do. I think if you go look at that monitoring guide, uh, it gives you all the steps, but uh, I don't think there's like a, a point and click thing that you can uh, just run. Um, Maybe that's not 100% true. I'm sure that the community has developed something like that. I don't think there's anything official on the uh, HashiCorp side. But if you go Google, um, you know, HashiCorp Vault Elk Stack or something, I'm I'm positive that someone has, uh, you know, set up a Docker container that I'll I'll do that for you. Um, uh, Laura, I know we're obviously uh, right close to the time, so I, I might answer yeah. maybe one more, and then we'll uh, uh, probably close it down. That sounds great. Um, we've already answered the question on when the 1.5 image will be available. Um, uh, there's uh, something in here, uh, a question about, hey, um, so back at our uh, HashiConf uh, digital conference, we announced that, um, you know, we're going to be, uh, we announced this new initiative called HashiCloud. Um, which basically is gonna offer a suite of uh, hosted products and Vault is one of them. Right now, obviously you, you, you need to go and run it yourself, but it, this is gonna be a managed offering. And the question is, um, do we have an ETA on when we're gonna launch that? Um, I don't have an ETA right now, but uh, I'd, uh, stay tuned. All right, uh, I think that's it for me. I wanted to thank, you for, thank everyone uh, very much for joining. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this release. Uh, there's a lot of cool things in here, especially around Helm. You know, a few releases ago, it was just a, a bare bones Helm chart. Then we added um, uh, HA support, integrated storage. Now we're adding OpenShift support. Uh, it's cool to see that project come to life. You know, it's cool to see uh, Splunk uh, come online here. Uh, resource quotas, uh, um, you know, it. Uh, we focused on improving the product quite a bit in this release and uh, um, hopefully uh, you get uh, some use out of it. All right, thanks very much and I'll, I'll kick it back to Laura.
Thanks, Justin, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks for the great participation as well. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, we'll be sending out a recording and the resources we mentioned um, during the presentation later this week. Um, and if you're interested in joining more events, check out hashicorp.com slash events, and we'll see you again soon.